All right, I'll get started. We usually have a lot of people coming from other meetings and get started. Um, and also a lot of this is already online. So the really exciting stuff is coming later. So when I get started, um, welcome to our spring session. Um, today, we're gonna have two presentations very different. The first one will be uh, an update for me on you know a recent uh, production release across the portals, some highlights of what things are new and what's to come. So I'm gonna run through that a little bit in the beginning. And then a scientific presentation about a, um, a project we collaborate with. Um, it's called the NCATS Biomedical Translator. And it's really relevant to what we're doing with our knowledge portal resource. I mean that because many of the resources that this project leverages and uses and the standards it's building as a software um, ecosystem are incredibly important for the resource that we make publicly accessible to you all. So Maria and Mark are gonna talk about that project, talk about sort of how it's, its conceptual framework, um, some of the things it's doing and how it actually will tie in ultimately to the knowledge portal. Because right now it's a, it's a very large consortium that's working very hard within itself, but I think it has some really cool um, implications for our resource and broadly. So with that, I'm gonna give you a little update on what's been going on, and then we'll hear our scientific update from Maria and Mark. So um, I wanna start with common disease portals. So some of the nice features we've added to our um, outside of the common metabolic disease knowledge portal, we've added some really cool features and data of this release to these portals. So I wanted to touch upon that for you at the beginning. First to our musculoskeletal portal, um, we're actually really excited to have uh, the addition of some more predicted effector genes. Collaborating with Ellie Zaghini and colleagues um, at, in, at, um, in Munich, they have recently produced a paper, you know, it's for the first of its kind, um, and largest of uh, meta-analysis for osteoarthritis, but it came with it a curated effector gene list, which I thought was quite elegant and quite elegant for this trait because this had not been done for this trait before. And what they did in the paper, as well as a meta-analysis, they presented an, an, a curated effector gene list from different regulatory elements, gene regulation, um, genetics, and perturbational evidence, and pulled it together into their paper. But this was buried in sort of like a supplemental figure and not accessible. And they partnered with us to actually make it an interactive tool for you to browse on the musculoskeletal knowledge portal. What's great about this is two things. If you're not a statistical geneticist and you don't wanna spend time waiting through p-values and Manhattan plots, you can go right here to determine what, we, what the community believes are the top genes for um, osteoarthritis right now and the evidence sources and how they're weighing them based on those evidence sources. So what this is, this is exactly what they put in their paper, but it's put into an interactive table with the underlying data. And what's nice about this is this connects you to all the other traits in the musculoskeletal disease knowledge portal, which is great because in many cases, you may wanna know about osteoarthritis, but you're also gonna to wanna to know about how these genes and variants impact bone mineral density and other anthropometric traits and grip strength, and other related traits in the musculoskeletal universe. So now you have this as a resource to you. So I, I invite you to check it out. So it has all the full um, evidence sources within it, exactly as the way as the paper intended for both the new and known um, loci, which I think is fantastic. And this is an area of growth for us where we're hoping to add more and more types of um, curated effector lists from communities. This is another example of that. Um, so I would check that out. Um, and the complete documentation is there, all the definitions and all the um, supporting information directly from the paper are, are made available to you in the portal. Again, for lung, we continue to update this disease community. Um, one of the additions in this recent release is the most recent host genetics um, in the for COVID-19 data sets. Iris really likes that. Uh, so that's now on the portal, fully integrated for you to view the association statistics along with all the other lung traits as well. This is quite nice because it gives you a sense of how you know the host genetics initiative for COVID-19 stacked up against the other um, common diseases for lung disease. Another portal brand new, this release, is a departure from our, um, our disease portal and a portal in another type of way of looking at data. It's non-additive effect, non-additive genetic effects knowledge portal. This we did in, in concept with Joseph Mercador, who was really, really passionate about it and it's actually a subject of one of his papers. So he made it accessible to you in a knowledge portal where you can have, it's about 300 traits um, for which they've presented results for non-additive effects. And you can view those here, but also in the context of other traits that are relevant to common metabolic disease. So it's another way, another lens into the same platform with different genetic models for you. This will be very useful in the future, actually, as we add things like pleiotropy results and other types of um, non-additive effects results to our knowledge portal framework. This is what it looks like, and feel free to, to its view it on the front homepage of the, all the portals. Third is something that we talked about um, at another um, um, 
webinar several months ago. This is something that's really been growing for us. And I'm really excited about this because it offers sort of a, an offshoot or a branch, if you will, of our knowledge portal suite built by the platform. We call this bring your own results or be your. Um, the idea being is you have results and you wanna make them accessible for paper or for your community so that you yourselves can browse them and share them amongst yourselves. Um, but there, you know, it's not a huge knowledge portal where it has, you need all the bells and whistles of the knowledge portals you've come to use. You just wanna visualize a certain type, set, set of data. Well, we've now released a software tool for you to do just that. If you can find it on our Knowledge Portal Network site, kp4cd.org, this is what it looks like at the top. It's all powered by our human genetics amplifier, that software platform I mentioned. But you can navigate whether you want to build a Knowledge Portal with us, which you've seen many of those products, or you just want to build your own. We have complete documentation, a demo portal, and classic canonical figures and features that you can load your own results to and make portals for papers, for publication, and ideally, leverage some of the work that we've been done, been doing within the resource, which is you can incorporate your own bio-index, we call it, but more specifically, any annotations that we have incorporated in the knowledge portals, you can incorporate into your BOR or your portals. If you're interested in talking to us about building one, I think it's best to collaborate because we learn things from you. Right now, we're working with folks who are giving us new ideas for visualizations that we're incorporating into the software platform. So this has been a really exciting thing for us and really looking forward to any ideas you have to make it better and to work with it. So you can find it at the bottom of the page right here. It gives you a sense of all the different portals we've built so far with it. Um, you can register for the service, get your own, your own how-to and tutorial and actually how it's built and the configuration. So some updates to our signature resource. This is actually a really exciting resource release for us for the Common Metabolic Disease Knowledge Portal because, you know, as we started in type 2 diabetes and expanded out to other disease areas, there's a lot of other major disease classes within common metabolic diseases we hadn't even scratched the surface of. And so with this release, we start to get at that space. So with that, a lot of new data. If you go to the Genetic Association data sets where you might want to find most of our data sets, this release has 10 new genetic data sets and some pretty cool marquee data sets. Brings 23 new traits to the knowledge portal for your browsing. So one is two for signature tra traits for common metabolic disease. One is from um, the Global Lipids Consortium, which is the largest for lipids um, meta-analysis to date. And this we collaborated with the community to bring those results to you. And those are integrated on the portal. The other one is CKD Gen. So this is the largest consortium for chronic kidney disease as well. So these results are now integrated and accessible on the portal. Other sort of unpublished and key diabetic complications data sets that are really relevant to um, diabetes and other common metabolic disease traits. It's an unpublished data set from Genie um, for diabetic kidney disease, and as well as you know, expanding into complications of diabetes with one specific complication being peripheral artery disease. So that's new to the knowledge portal with this release. Another investment for common metabolic disease is liver disease. We actually were quite underrepresented on the portal with that um, until today. So now we have some, um, some key data sets, six to name a few, and you can see their, 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 their sizes up above, but they include NAFLD and cirrhosis and liver enzymes, GWAS, accessible to you on the portal as well. So this brings us into liver disease, which is something we had very much um, minimally represented historically. Then, and additionally, working with our collaborators at the NIDDK, we really wanna you know, make this a comprehensive resource. So we've decided to add in gestational diabetes and other rep reproductive traits with this release as well. So there's three data sets that represent that, some of which directly contributed by our collaborators kindly to the portal. Look for more of these in the future. future. This is an area of investment for us that we really wanna expand. Um, so if you have any ideas for traits in this space, please contact to us directly. So other things that are really valuable in terms of results is, as I mentioned earlier, for the osteoarthritis community, we brought in the factor curated list. Well, this is an unpublished one for type one diabetes. Um, Kyle Galton, who has uh, led one of the largest meta-analysis for type one, did, a, did an investigation to essentially take those results, combine them with other results, and also integrate you know, regulation, regulatory and perturbational evidence and produce an, a heuristic for um, type one diabetes effector genes and present it on the portal. And what I love about this one, that's sort of a little step change for us is particularly because, you know, he's, he, he works with us on building the portal more broadly and he leads the um, common metabolic um, disease genome atlas at UCSD. 
we really want to, one of the things we really wanted to ensure is that the evidence sources are accessible to you. So if you make a claim about, about a gene being, you know, a tier one or the likely effector transcript at a locus, you want to have all the evidence sources, not just displayed, which is good and useful, but beyond that, can you allow the researcher to actually get at those results? And with this, I've seen a nice ex expansion in our platform because now we've connected the underlying data to where it's stored. So sometimes it's just in a publication where you see the PMID. But if you want to go to own them to find the results, that clicks, that if you click that, it takes you directly to those results. My favorite part is here. If you click CMDGA for this particular gene, you can actually go to the QTL evidence that supports this particular claim. And it's accessible to you through the CMDGA. Even more often, I mean, moreover, you can actually access the raw data. This is the goal of what we're trying to build out with this is not just, you know, present the knowledge to present all the lines of evidence and where they are and how to get at them with any effector transcript that we share. So this is a really nice thing. We're hoping that this is something we can build into all the existing lists on the portal and make available to users. One thing I'm really happy about, just came out yesterday, so I added this early slide, is as a paper from Jason Blanick's lab in cell metabolism, which um, describes a feature we have on the portal as a, um, as a sort of a beta version or a labs piece, but now it's published, so it should be incorporated more broadly in the portal, but it allows you to evaluate human genetic support um, for, for metabolic disease genes. And the paper is excellent. I, I definitely recommend you reading it, but if you wanna play with the tool, you can find it here in the portal under the KP Labs page. Pick your favorite gene, pick your favorite phenotype, and see what the huge calc, as we like to call it, um, gives you for a score. This has been the subject of a couple um, actual webinars for us. We actually have a tutorial about it and a video if you want to learn how to, how to use it, because it is a little bit thick in terms of the different things it presents, but I think it's really worth it if you're interested in those types of things. So finally, some features um, to the entire platform. So these are you know, new updates that we make to the software that we make accessible to all the common metabolic disease knowledge portals, but also the um, the common disease portals as well. So it's the same software that you see across. So this was the subject of um, um, our last webinar as well, but so I'll quickly touch upon it. One thing of note, a major release from our CMDGA, which supports annotations across all of, of our disease portals. They have a recent update, which brought them to 4,193 annotations that are relevant to common disease more broadly with a focus on common metabolic diseases currently but you can now access those through our new interactive visualization for prioritization of variants. You can find that here under the variant sifter. You can also find it on a classic region page. So if you type in your favorite region at the top, you'll get you know, the bars of all the genome-wide significant hits. At the bottom of the page, you see the elegant visualization from Locusum and all the genes in the region. If you want to then sort of combine the best of those two um, features and go into a different space, we wanted to select from a visualization with annotations, incredible sets, you could actually prioritize variants using this feature. So it's also here, if you click that button, it'll take you to whatever region you selected here in the variant sifter. And this is what it looks like. Um, we did this at last webinar, so I'm not gonna spend time on this day. This is an active thing. I think DK is pushing updates regularly. It's quite elegant. Um, and we can talk about this more. I think this is actually subject of a, another webinar in the future as we add more things because you can actually filter different annotations. You can see where they union, where they overlap, and you can select variants based on these criteria. And we're adding more and more criteria as we go. So look for this in the future, but I want to make sure you knew it was there. Um, other things on horizon. So this summer is going to be pretty exciting for two reasons. One, in, in May, Maria is going to lead a focus group about an interactive um, new feature for non-coding burden tests. What I love about this is it opened up, opens up the doors for a lot of the large scale whole genome data sets that are out there, top med being one of them, UK Biobank being another. It allows us to um, allow the user to run non-coding burden tests with different filters and annotations based on genomic annotations, based on different features of variants that they care about. This tool is in a beta version right now, we've circulated to a couple of folks, but Maria is gonna be beta testing it with you all um, in May. So if you're interested, please contact us. And we'd love to have you on board for that. It will probably be available in the portal soon thereafter in early summer. Another thing I want to mention is, you know, a lot of the times the best webinars we ever give are ones that spotlight the scientists that really build, um, that, that generate the data actually that we, we represent within the portal. So we're going to be adding to our seminar series, investigators from the AMP CMD initiative. 
And so the first one that um, I'm very happy is willing to um, participate is Klaus Kessner from UPenn, who's one of the PIs of one of the functional genomics projects from the NIDDK. He's going to come talk about his work, what he's trying to do as part of the AMP CMD initiative, and then eventually we'll sort of tie that all into how the portal will represent those work long term. So look for that in the future. Um, and then ADA, American Diabetes Association in June is where we always have a, um, a sort of a, an open uh, release of, of our updates. And also we'll be actually visiting this for the first time since the pandemic in person. So we'll be doing a production update for that as well. And then um, this summer, I'll be doing a webinar about our lucky expansion based on an award from NHGRI to common disease. So to bring together all of the portals that we've built for disease communities into one resource that is for association to function of, of um, common disease. And the idea being that all the data and resources that are accessible in these community portals that we've built can be integrated into one resource um, for you to see and interact with those data. So with that, um, I will turn it over to Maria and Mark. And if you have any questions, please contact us. Again, um, I think our email is always on the portal, but you can always email me because um, many of you know me, but ask us any questions. And we'd love to hear from you if you're interested in giving us any feedback as you use some of these tools. And um, um, if you wanna have any collaborations, also give us a, a shout as well. So with that, I'll stop share and turn it over to Mark and Maria. And mute myself. Okay, um, I think I'm sharing my screen. Let me start this. There we go. Okay, um, so what I'd like to talk to you about today is um, just to give a brief overview of um, our team's um, participation in a really exciting um, large consortium. Um, with a very ambitious goal. Um, so it's the NCATS Biomedical Translator Consortium. And their aim, to, this is taken from a publication of theirs, is to deconstruct the translational Tower of Babel. And I'll, I'll um, explain what I mean by that. So today, um, as I said, I'm just gonna give a brief introduction to Translator, give you an idea of what it is, and then talk a little about, a bit about our team's role in it um, as a genetics knowledge provider. And then Mark is going to take you through a bit more of the details, the nuts and bolts, and um, demonstrate what it's like to ask a query of the translator system. So Translator is, is a huge collaboration with more than 200 people involved at 30 institutions, and it's coordinated by the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, which is an NIH institute. And um, it has um, well, the idea of Translator is that there, um, there's just an explosion of biomedical data of many different types, um, you know, data in the literature, uh, data from genome-wide association studies, um, other types of large-scale proteomics, epigenomics, um, clinical data, drug information, and all of these data are kind of scattered and siloed, and they don't talk to each other. So there is um, undoubtedly meaningful information that you could get by connecting these types of data and looking at them in, in aggregate, um, but it's really impossible now. And so the goal of Translator is to create a system that will do this, that will connect these different data types with, um, with uh, defined relationship types and allow people to ask questions about them. So um, the goal, the reason to do this um, is basically to help us understand human disease. Um, we could, you know, understand the molecular basis of human disease and how that um, affects the clinical observations. Um, it might lead to our understanding how different diseases are related. Um, and of course, there are just many, many implications this would have for personalized medicine drug repurposing and you know, a whole bunch of useful stuff that would really just, just benefit um, uh, medicine in general and human health. So that's, that's the idea and the goal. Um, and this is a figure from a, a paper written by the consortium. And so um, the consortium is divided into different teams of people who with different expertise. And one type of team that we are is a knowledge provider. So the knowledge providers, um, get data from all these various sources according to their own expertise. Um, as, as I said, things like the literature and large scale, um, <clears throat> large scale data sets and, and many other sources. And each knowledge provider 
um, provides makes ways to provide those types of data to to the translator system. And so, yes, as I said, there are different, there's data about genes and variants, functional data, pathway data, um, uh, you know, diagnostic tests, clinical data, drugs. There's many different kinds of data that are relevant to, to human physiology and, and health and disease. And these um, data types are all connected in a, a knowledge graph um, with relationships to each other that are um, semantically defined and can be computed on. And so then the translator reasoners, and this is, I'm not an engineer, so this is way out of my expertise, but somehow magically they, they query these relationships and these data types and um, come up with, um, with relationships between them. And the idea is that just a, an average bench scientist with no computational expertise can ask a natural language question, just something like, "What genes might be involved in this disease that I'm interested in?" Or, um, you know, are there other drugs that might be repurposed to treat this disease, and so forth. And so they would be able to query translator and get um, a list of results that might contain um, things that you know had not been known. Well, things that had been known um, in in bits and pieces, but were not apparent because the bits and pieces had had not yet been been pulled together. Um, and so we're providing genetic association data to translator. And um, how can this help translator? Well, it's um, the translator, um, the aim of translator is to understand human disease. And um, it's been shown that genetic data is really predictive of, uh, genetic association is really predictive of whether a gene product um, is um, involved in a disease, um, that is, if it can be a good drug target. So um, several studies have shown, and this is a table from one of them, looking at drugs that, that um, you know, either passed or failed in clinical trials. And the ones that had support from human genetics were um, more likely to be uh, successful than the ones that didn't. So um, we think that providing genetic association data will be helpful to translator. Um, so we've had we've done a couple of different things for for translators so far. Um, well, first of all, there's a lot of interest within the consortium in rare diseases, um, and these are usually caused by or often caused by you know single gene mutations. And um, these data are well curated and captured in other resources. But we've we've done some work to help um, curate and provide these data to translator. But primarily, our effort is to provide um, large scale genetic associations. So this little um, figure here is um, from the GWAS catalog, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. Each of these blocks is a chromosome. Those tiny little dots are variants that are significantly associated with the disease or trait. So the point is that there are hundreds of thousands of them. Um, and so they're not very easily interpretable as, as they are. And um, our goal is to help interpret um, the meaning of these associations and, and provide that to translator. So yeah, we can address a few gaps um, in the translator project with, with our expertise. And yes, as the first, as I said, um, these, these associations for common diseases are statistical. Um, so for a complex disease, um, there are many genetic variants that affect um, the risk of that disease. And they, they each individually usually have a fairly small effect. So they have to be considered in aggregate. Um, also, the, these associations are usually in non-coding regions, and it's not obvious which gene they, they even affect. So tying an association to a, a gene or a function or a pathway is not um, straightforward at all. And thirdly, um, there is a lot more information that can be gotten out of a GWAS um, beyond just the, the top variants that are associated with the disease or trait. Um, by computing on the, the stati summary statistics and by combining them with various other types of data, we can make a lot of other predictions about um, genes, tissues, and, and traits. So we can provide that kind of information to translator as well. So um, I, I have a list of some of our specific goals that we're trying to accomplish with translator. Um, one of them is to expand the, the sources and types of data and method results 
um, that we integrate within the knowledge portal network and provide a translator. And of course, this is totally aligned with what we're trying to do anyway, as the knowledge portal network is to, to expand all these things and bring them to you, the, the, the researcher. So that's, that's very, uh, that works really well. And um, so a couple of things we've done so far for translator in this line um, are to help um, provide predictions about gene disease links and pathway disease links. And we've done this um, using an algorithm called MAGMA, um, which basically takes um, genome-wide associations um, and um, from them calculates a gene level association. So it, it comes up with gene disease or gene trait links. And um, each of these is assigned a score um, indicating the likelihood of, or the strength of that association. So that is one thing we do. And MEGMA also uh, comes up with pathway en enrichments, so biological pathways. And this, this is, can be very helpful in interpreting GUS results. So we have um, provided those MEGMA results as well. Um, another goal of ours is kind of the converse, that as Translator uh, generates information, we want to integrate it into the knowledge portals as appropriate. And so we've um, done a little bit of this. It's um, at a, an early stage, but here's one type of information that we thought was was very um, was easy, easily obtainable, and and really made sense to include in the knowledge portals. So um, we're getting these annotations um, via mygene.info web services, and that they are part of the translation translator group. So on our gene pages, this shows the common metabolic diseases knowledge portal, but it's on, it's on every knowledge portal. Um, up at the top, there are two tabs, gene ontology and pathways. And that's where we show this information. So the gene ontology annotations tab shows um, all the annotations for this gene and um, linked to the, the, uh, the go term in the ontology and also to the PubMed ID of the publication that supports that annotation. And then on the pathways tab, there are lists of pathways and they are linked back to the pathway information in the database that they're derived from, such as Reactome. Um, okay, um, our last three goals as the genetics knowledge, knowledge provider are, are um, pretty straightforward. Um, we want to continue to develop new algorithms um, that will improve our, our ability to get meaning from genetic and genomic data. Um, and of course, we need to provide a translator with these with this information in a standards compliant way. And um, that's our engineers are working on that. You'll hear more from Mark in a little bit. And um, another important task is to contribute to evaluation of translator. So um, it's um, this is a large, complex system, and um, it's, it's going to have to be evaluated very closely to make sure that the data sources are the right ones, that the, the answers are, you know, make sense, um, and so forth. And um, a lot of this has already been done, but there's, there's still a lot more work to do. It needs to be ongoing. And so we definitely want to help um, participate in this process of, of just evaluating translation, translators' scientific validity and improving it. And also, this is where you come in. So our our knowledge portal um, users, um, you, you, researchers in uh, genetics and um, common diseases, we we really need um, you to help evaluate the translator. Um, all those things that I just mentioned, the data sources, the the um, the quality of the results, and also a, a user interface is being developed, and that that will need. Um, people to try it and, and um, evaluate it and give feedback. So um, I hope that some of you are interested in this. That'd be great. And please let us know if you are, and, and we will bring you in to help us with this. And that is all I have. So I'm going to turn it over to Mark. Oh, I think. It says I can start my video, but I guess that's fine. I'll I'll just share my screen. Can people hear me? Yeah, and I can try and do that as you're going, Mark. I can change the presentation. So I know where it's um okay, so just um just to go through the uh 
So I'm going to do a basic demonstration of, uh, of the translator using one of the um, one of the components that actually well it, it's um, it's it's um, uh, using a, a system that we use to test the translator, but it has a, a nice GUI currently to be able to show how the translator works. So, so the translator, the nuts and bolts of the translator is is built in essence on these this, these relationships between two nodes. Um, um, and pretty much the way that works is that the nodes are specified by their, they're specified by an ontology. So a QID, so type two diabetes would be Mondo 5148. And then they're specified also by what type they are. Are they a gene, are they a drug, are they a disease? And the type, the type is specified based on the on this biolink model, which is a hierarchical relationship of types. So, if I go to... so there's actually a link here. There's a link in the presentation, um, but in essence, it comes down to this. Um, so, in essence, you have the name thing, which is the root type. And then as you get down the tree, you get more specific all the way to cell behavior, drug, vitamin um, also. Um, and so the, the nodes are linked by an edge, which also have a type. And the, the edge obviously has to make sense for the two nodes that are being linked. So obviously a, a drug is not genetically associated with a clinical intervention, but a gene is genetically associated with a disease. And these edges also have, um, are based on the BioLink model. And, and it's also a hierarchical relationship. So, and this is in the BioLink. And as you can tell from the demo here, there's actually a, a model version which changes. So this is a, a work in progress. I mean, it's always moving. And this is the current, I mean, this is the one. So this is a, an example of, again, so the root node is related to, so in essence, if even if you don't provide a particular type for a relationship, it's gonna to default to related to, and then you can specify the relationship in a more, um, more precise manner. And so in essence, once you have sets of nodes that are linked by a relationship, you can start putting these things together so that you could build a more like a, in essence, a graph. So question of a query here is, if you go to bottom left for the gene DPP4, what um, disease is it linked to? And then based on those relation, based on those results, you can go from those diseases, what other genes but they genetically associated with. And then a question that we've been asking ourselves, which is one of the, you know, we're to, to try to troubleshoot the system and, and, uh, and tune it, is we're taking the PPR gamma gene and we're trying to figure out what relationships to what, path, you know, what pathways is it a part of? And then from those pathways, which ones of those pathways are linked to type two diabetes, which is Mondo 5148. And so, so that's the basic of that's the the base that's the basic model of the data. So in essence, you have you have providers, you have teams that are providing these these one to one links, node to node links with a relationship, and then you would have these ARAs, which then take these one to one relationships. So these are the what we call knowledge providers. So in essence. Our team is one of them. We provide genetic association data between um, genes and diseases and also pathways and diseases. And then what happens is the ARAs will take these one-to-one -one relationships and combine them. So let's say you, you have a, if you take the query above, which in essence, what we call a two hop, which is in essence, is two different questions. If you go to the ARS, which is a central system that you enter your query in, it then feeds that data out to the ARAs and then the ARAs, which are called autonomous relay agents, they would actually break that question down into, you know, bite-sized chunks, which would then be fed to the individual knowledge providers which have that data. So, and currently the, 
the translator group has 10 knowledge providers or 10 or more knowledge providers, um, six autonomous relay agents and one central interaction node. And all, all systems are independent web services. And this is important in essence because it makes it very easy for individual institutions to, in essence, share their data out to the, to the, um, to the translator consortium. And it makes it easier to really plug these individual systems in one by one, and so that they interact. And this is all done. I'm gonna, I'm, I'll spread the details on this, but it's all done through JSON in a particular. There's a particular dictionary and, and particular um, construction of JSON that you have to use. But eventually, the, I mean, the ARS and and the UI that Maria mentioned uh, will abstract all that, so that you know you really it'll have just a nice GUI interface. And then you just, as far as everything gets linked together, you just, I mean, it'll be done. Um, you, know, you won't have to know the, the actual technical details of the system. And so the results that you get, so let's say you look for, you know, genes associated with a particular disease here, it's, uh, you know, 11, 9, 36. The results that you get is, once you query the ARAs, you would get all these different results that come from all these different knowledge providers. And the results include provenance, ideally, which would be, you know, PubMed IDs, but they could also be, you know, calculated values on, like on, on our end, we provide p-values. Um, and then you also get annotations and scores, so p-values. And then the autonomous relay agents that I was referencing before, so they break down the queries into multiple pieces. And then they rank the results based on a particular algorithm that they use on their own. So an example query would be what PPR gamma pathways are associated with type 2 diabetes. Actually, I'll demo this right now using the test. Um, so here's the query, here's the JSON that I was referencing. Um, I'm just going to skip over it. And then I'm going to post to the, this array called ARAX because it has a really nice GUI that shows how the query, the query running. So here what it did is it took the gene, the pathway piece and, and separated it out from the pathway to disease piece. And what it's doing here is it's actually querying individual knowledge providers that have gene to pathway data. And it's skipping the ones that it knows it does not have that data. And as this data returns, once it's returned for all the nodes that it's queried, it would actually go back down to step number two. And based on those results, it'll find the data, the pathway to disease data. As you can see, since this is a web service, the, the system in and of itself, as far as speed goes, is, is limited by the speed of the individual components, but also the fact that it's you know, this is a web-based application, which means it's traveling over the, the public wires, which is, you know, not, it's not gonna be as, as performance as if it's all running at, you know, um, in a particular institution. And then here, as we can tell, so as this data comes back, it actually starts querying for the second step. And then it actually gets the results back. And then if I go here, I will get the actual results that it comes back as far as all the different links that it found. And if I click on, if I click on one of them, I will see lipid metabolic process, PPR gamma type two diabetes. If I click on the actual link of the genetic association, It's going to come back to actually our the, the genetics team's um, data, but if I go to here, I guess I'm looking for. So the anytime you click on one of these links, you get the individual data that supports that link. And so the genetics team, so the you know the. I mean, the team that's part of the AMP consortium. So we provide genetic association results. So genes to phenotypes and pathways to phenotypes slash disease. The results we provide are annotated with score of zero to one. So based on the p-values that are produced from the MAGRA results that Maria mentioned, 
the annotations and the strength of the study, we actually we actually provide a um, just in essence uh, like um, a quantitative you know score on the results. And what I mean by strength of study is that we also have incorporated other data sources aside from the magma ones, um, like Gene Bass, which I believe is based on the UK Biobank, and um, ClinVar and ClinGen, among others. So the computer data is magma, downloaded data, ClinVar, ClinGen, GenCC, and Gene Bass. And we're also leading an effort to try to make the transfer the translator useful for research. So in essence, if a new gene is, if uh, through some GWAS study, a new gene or another, you know, sequencing study, a gene is found to, let's say, be related to, seems to have um, a genetic associ association with a disease, uh, you eventually want to get to the um, functional aspect of it. And that's in one way is to use a translator to figure out the pathway that not only that gene is a part of, but also the pathway that is a, that could be affecting that particular disease. And so this is a demo query I just did, and these are the results. And so this is a demo result where you actually get the PubMed ID down here. And so, and so that's the the provenance piece of all the results. All the results have a provenance. Um, it's very important for once the results come back that we can trace back where they came from. And so, I mean, not to get too much into the weeds, but it also states the knowledge sources that were, you know, that were in the different hops that acquired that knowledge. That, and so that's part of the provenance itself. And then this was a, this is a query that we did for, um, for an end of the year demo. Um, and this was interesting. In essence, you know, based on multiple sclerosis, you know, the, the first query was find chemical entities or drugs that treat multiple sclerosis. And then, you know, we had a, an SME, a subject matter expert, we get involved and then they said, oh, these are the interesting drugs, you know, that. And so the, the first one would be based on the clinical, clinical evidence. So, you know, based on clinical evidence or at least um, like treatment evidence, you know, what drugs did, did people see um, affected multiple sclerosis? You know, ideally in a in a positive in a positive way, and then the subject matter expert actually would pick, let's say, one drug, and then you would run a second query which says, you know, based on multiple sclerosis and that drug, find any genes that are common to both. So, which genes are are genetically associated associated with multiple sclerosis, and at the same time that that drug actually you know, would, would hit those, those gene sets. And then based on that gene set, find any other drug, which also would affect those genes. And the idea there being that if that gene is being perturbed by this drug, then, and this drug is actually, has a positive effect with multiple sclerosis, then chances are another drug that actually treats that gene also should have a positive effect for multiple sclerosis. I mean, that's the, the hypothesis that we are trying to, you know, find based on this, this particular query. And so the translator next step. So, so the last year was, I mean, in my view, was really focused on getting all these systems in place and, and connected. And, and as, as you can see from the demo, they return a lot of results. I mean, it's, it's really, I mean, it's, it, it's really nice over one year to be able to get, you know, in essence, you know, 20, 20, 30, 40 plus data sources kind of connected together and actually exchanging data based on one query. Um, and so the next step is there's a new UI being developed. I mean, that's a major effort. Um, we're also, there's a lot of work being done on improving the ranking results so that the, you know, now you get the results, but also, you know, figuring out a way algorithms other ways to actually really have the, you know, the certain results like bubble up to the top. And then obviously we always add new data as it becomes available, at least on our team. And I'm sure others are as well. So, I mean, anytime we're adding more data to the portal, we try to take that data and actually add it back into the translator as well. So anytime any new data sets that we add, 
that drive our portals ideally should also are going to be eventually will end up in translator as well. And that's it. Thanks, Mark. Maria, that was great, actually. A uh, really good uh, update of about a project. And actually, Jason is here to have a couple comments because I think it's good to frame some of this in the context of what we're trying to do more broadly. So Jason, yeah, I just right. wanted to say a couple things as to touch on why we felt this was a good thing to share in this forum today. Um, and beyond just, you know, it's scientifically interesting project. Um, and it's that translators are very big, important effort by the, you know, at NIH, it involves a lot of different groups. I don't know if Maria and Mark fully stated how big of a project this is, but I think it includes upwards of what, 15 or so different groups, each of which is composed of other groups. It's a very, very big project. And at the core of it, there's many, many goals, but I think as geneticists or people who are interested in genetic data, the real thing I think it's going to do for us is to make all of the, informatic data in the world, the vision is to make it so rather than having to go to different places to query it all and connect it in your own mind, that you would have one place where it's all nicely organized for you and you can much more easily query it, right? Mm -hmm. So even if you don't buy into the whole reasoning part of this and the AI part of it, the, the prospect of all of the data being put on a common footing and being able to query it better is, is really valuable. You know, one of the many things we do all the time is we have a gene that might emerge either from a genetic study or some other study, and we want to find everything we know about it. And you know, I'm sure everyone here has like searched PubMed and searched Reactome and searched all of these things. <clears throat> and um, you know, the, the, to be able to do that in a more streamlined way, that's I think quite an attractive prospect. And what, as Mark indicated, this project's at an inflection point. You know, really, it was just last year that we had that all the plumbing got put together. And the project is now transitioning, as Mark said, into, into really starting to target the user, both in terms of the interface, which is being built, and also in terms of tuning how users interact with the system to, to do queries in a way that are scientifically valid. And so if the prospect of being able to connect to a harmonized body of data is attractive to you, or you buy into that vision, you, and you're interested, you actually have a tremendous opportunity to shape how translator uh, works. You have, there's something like a hundred, I don't know, hundreds of people in this consortium, but they're very limited on actual scientists who can think about how to optimally use this in translational research. And so people who um, are willing to engage with that um, type of people, and, and you know, that would be, we would mediate that and we would be showing you translator in, in, in smaller sessions, um, can really have an outsized impact on how this thing evolves. So that's really why we wanted to reach out today, just to share this with you. It's something we'll be giving updates on over, you know, in subsequent Years as well as we try to integrate this more with the portal and as we try to you know um, develop this project out more but in particular we're going to be we're trying to reach out to people who who are both interested in translational research from the genetics perspective as well as the process of integrating data to see whether they could help uh, guide our work so please reach out to us as maria said uh, we'll also probably be contacting some of you but we would we'll love to have people who are interested in this get in touch with us Yeah, I would echo that. Particularly also, you know, I think we're also thinking about there's also, you know, this doesn't have a this they're working on building the user interface, as Mark indicated. And I think having feedback on how that would be used by a, you know, a non-expert would be awesome. Um, because I think they they are taking this on. Actually, Andy's on the call and they are interested in working with you because I think that they'd be a great group to talk to as well, because they're thinking about how you present this information, how would you interact with it? And that's something that we would love to be part of with um, with them. So reach out to us, connect with us, and we'll connect you with Andy. Um, but then on the portal side, you know, just bring it back to it, you know, Maria showed some of the places where those knowledge portals providers have been made accessible in, on the portal. And I think it goes both ways. And I think that's one, one thing that's really lovely about us being part of this, this transit ecosystem is it exposes us to groups who do things really well in different disease domains, I mean, um, um, domains and it is a group of people who've done a really good job about developing standards and approaches to, to connect those domains. And I think that's a really important and un, um, um, un, um, appreciated activity that our field needs to do in order to make some of these resources that are being made, made you know, touting themselves as translators more broadly useful. So I think that's why the, the work right now is the UI and the validity of the results. And so we're really excited to work with you on this. So 
Um, with that, any other questions? I see some nice questions from the chat. People have been answering them. Thank you, Mark. Um, we had a good question from Alex who was asking, um, where was it? It was a good question. Maybe other people know it. It was, is it possible to run queries that include sets of nodes, i.e. pathways associated with the sets of genes and set of traits? And Mark answered that, yes, you can do that. You can do a batch query. Um, the node IDs, types, and relationships can be um, arrays of values. So that's one thing to note. But if you have any questions, please contact us. Our next webinar will be in June. Um, look for that. We haven't finalized a topic for that. We'll get that out to you shortly. Um, but if you're interested in our focus group, going back to some of the resources, you'll be hearing about if that will be actually testing a beta version of that non-coding burden test that I mentioned to you um, for TopMed as our principal data set that we're using, expanding to UK Biobank. Really cool activity. I love this feature. I hope you all will uh, stay tuned for that. So with that, we'll give you some eight minutes back to uh, go on to your next meeting. And um, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Jason. And um, take care, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks. Bye-bye.